have is a course about non-invertible symmetries. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just check. You can hear me in the back and you can read what's written here also. All right, brilliant. So here's a very quick recap of the first lecture. The first lesson that you were sort of told and then we substantiated it, it makes sense, is that global symmetries we should think of as really topological operators in your quantum field theory. And that sort of, that insight then taught us to think about standard symmetries, or what we would now call zero form symmetries, uh, in a slightly more general context in terms of p-form symmetries. And p-form symmetries act on p-dimensional operators, and they're generated by some topological operators which have to link non-trivially with p-dimensional operators, and those are precisely uh, d minus p minus one dimensional topological operators. And we were so far assuming that they all have very nice group-like structures, so these operators would compose or fuse together um, into a group. Now, the first extension from, if you put p equals to zero, you just go back to a standard symmetry, right? And this is just a co-dimension one topological operator. But if you actually go to p equals to one, then the charged objects are line operators. And the symmetries are generated by co-dimension two. So for example, two-dimensional topological operators in four dimensions or line operators in three dimensions, which compose in terms of a group that we call GP. So in this case, GP is one. And then I cheated here a little bit because someone asked a question in the question session that allowed me to say, well, actually, you can really think of um, local operators as sort of objects that could screen, once you have certain types of local operators, they could screen uh, the uh, one form symmetry. So in this case, you could have a Wilson line uh, in a representation R, and that could end on a local operator. If you have this local operator in your theory, then that topological defect doesn't have a non-trivial linking. There's something wrong with the audio, right? Anyway, um, sorry. Let's see whether this is better. Okay, so if you have this linking here, you can just strip it off, collapse it, and the charge would be trivial. So this is sort of the, the way you can then determine these higher form symmetries, or in this case, one form symmetries, in gauge theories, so pure gauge theories with simply connected groups, we saw that they are, have one form symmetries that are the center. Okay, so we are not done yet with invertible symmetries. There's some sort of backlog, and I'll just try to explain some things which we'll need um, to then actually discuss the, higher, uh, the, the extension to non-invertibles. So one thing that I want to talk about today is background fields. for higher form symmetries. So if you have a standard zero form symmetry, you know how to couple this to a background field. And so for p equals to zero, some group G0, you would introduce a gauge field, a background gauge field. So A1 is a background. gauge field, or to add some term to action, J times A or something, and then you could sum over A or integrate over all the, uh, the, the connections that you would like to consider, and that would gauge that symmetry. And so for P larger than zero, so for G P form symmetry, uh, we equally have to introduce so the concept of coupling this to a background. And the uh, background fields here for p-form symmetry are p-plus-1 forms. And I'll sort of always assume, uh, this, I didn't emphasize this again, but when p is uh, larger than 0, these are abelian. Um, and I very often think of these as actually 
uh, discrete, so finite, uh, actually finite uh, symmetry groups. So these D P plus one fields are P forms, uh, P plus one forms on your space time uh, taking values in this group G P. So for example, if you have your SU2 pure Young Mills in four dimensions, we said this has a Z2 one form symmetry. Then um, this would introduce a two form background field, and that would take values in H2 of M4 with Z2 coefficients. Okay. So we also discussed yesterday how we go from SU2. So there's basically, since there's a global form SU2, which has a Z2 center one form symmetry, there's also a sort of a gauged form. So we also looked at uh, sort of the PSU3, or as it's more commonly known, the SO3 theory. Pure Young Mills theory. Um, and this has actually sort of magnetic. Z2 it's magnetic. A PSU2. Uh, sorry, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. PSU2, more commonly known as SO3. I mean, you could also just say this is uh, spin 3, right? And um, this has a magnetic. Uh, one form symmetry. And the question is how do you go from this theory to that theory? And actually, what you have to do is you have to gauge this Z to one form symmetry. So, actually, when you have these background fields, normally when you, when you, when you couple them to a standard zero form background, you would then integrate over this here. These are actually for finite group backgrounds, actually, what we have is sort of discrete values of this. So in fact, gauging uh, the Z2 one form, maybe I should call this here the one form symmetry electric, and this is the magnetic, uh, the electric one in SU2 becomes the SO3 theory with Z2 one magnetic. And so what does this mean in terms of the partition functions? So I have our theory, so T, so T is the theory with um, Z to one form symmetry, and I just want to gauge the Z to electric. I have coupled this now to another background field. This is again a one form symmetry, but it actually is a one form symmetry. Now, not the same background field, because this is sort of here, the electric, if you want to be pedantic. This should be so the superscripts. Uh, there's another two form field, and this is obtained in terms of just summing over all the B2s in H2 and for um, Z2 on electric. And now we have to, with notation that I choose, e to the 2 pi i B, B hat. Where T here is this theory, the SU2 theory. And there's some normalization factor, which is basically the order of the groups, so in this case, there's a half. So this gives, if we look at the partition function for the SU2 theory, couple it to this B2 background, and our sum over all the allowed configurations, that gives us, in fact, the, uh, with this weight factor here, I'll explain what this is in a second, this now depends on B hat, and this is then the partition function for the SO3 theory. So what is this B hat? Is the, is the, so B hat is an element in H2, on four, Z2, one magnetic. And now the question is, what do I mean by this bracket? So I had this bracket here, uh, B B hat. Um, this actually 
it will be appearing, this should become a phase. So this better be some well-defined sort of uh, phase that I can sort of shove in here. So the question is, what is this pairing between B and B hat? So this is defined, or actually, let's put it like this. This is a map from H2, M4, Z2, uh, times H2, magnetic, into, well, you can call it U1 or R mod Z. So it's a pairing. Now, how do I define this pairing? Well, H2 is Poincare uh, dual to H lower 2. And these two actually have a pairing already from the Dirac pairings. Basically, this is a well-defined thing that gives us precisely a U1-valued object, or a R mod Z-valued object. I should probably really write R mod Z. OK, so more generally, if we do this for a P form, this has a BP plus 1 background, and we gauge it in D dimensions. I and mean, then I need to do sort of the calculation, what is the degree of this form? Then you get a dual uh, B hat, and the degree of that is uh, D minus P minus 1. And that is for a D minus P minus 2 form symmetry. So normally, there's a question. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, so I, that's why I actually took the law. That's right. So here, this whole thing you could say is B. Um, so for, for P equals to 1 and D equals to 4, right, the one form symmetry is went to one form symmetry, so B2 went into B2 hat. But generically, you'll be mapping a P-form symmetry to a Q-form symmetry of this degree. So you're not mapping within um, when you gauge from one to the other. So yesterday, a lot of people asked, oh, how do you actually write down these generators? Because it started off, yes, there's a question. Excuse me, I didn't hear the question, so I don't know what happened. Why did you ah, so he the was just exponential? asking about, it shouldn't this be, if this is a phase, right, you can leave it as 2 pi i. And then you just have here R mod Z, this is fine. He was just saying you could, it's a phase, it's a, it went into U1, you can define the map either with the log or without. Today's the day of the logs. <laughs> I shall get a log missing, I had a log missing, so here we go. Yep. Great. Um, sorry, just for clarify me, um, H2 is a group uh, of cohomology or, or? A cohomology group. Ah, okay, okay, right. Yes, sorry, absolutely, okay. All right, um, H2, where is the first time this appears? So HP plus one is a cohomology with these coefficients. So as I think of it as forms, and in fact, maybe for people not familiar with, you know, cohomology with discrete coefficients, Give me one second, and maybe I think this might be useful. I know a lot of people uh, do holography here. So I will tell you how you can think of these form fields from a slightly more you know, holographic perspective. And this goes actually back to the, exactly these kind of uh, gauging. So basically, one way of thinking about these B2s is either as elements in this sort of cohomology where you have these discrete values, or you can also think of them as coming from a theory, which is actually uh, where you, everything is so alternative description, where these are actually U1 valued, and they are actually then sitting, so this is a U1 valued description, where the fields, I should maybe call them now little b2, um, have an action in the following way. So let's say we are looking at a P-form symmetry. So let's actually put, let's leave it as, uh, as a Z2, but we can, okay, we can too put it as, uh, let's leave it as N. So these are U1 fields, B2, 
and B2 hat. And I have an action here in five dimensions. This is something you will have seen before. It's like a BF theory. But now you have an action where there's an N out front. So in fact, if you look at very crudely at the equations of motion, you would get something like that N dB2 is zero or N dB2 hat is zero. And so you would normally, this N weren't there, just say dB2 is zero, so it's closed. But actually here is this freedom of N. So in fact, this also is a way you could characterize fields that have, in that case, now a ZN valued homology class in terms of U1 fields. Is this clarifying useful or there's a way of, so if, you know, if you, if you don't want to use sort of this formulation with discrete coefficients, you can think about it like that. So yesterday people were asking me how, what, what are actually these, uh, the generators, right? So now we looked at these background fields. And when I started off talking about these, these symmetries, I had the current and I constructed the symmetry generators from Noether's current. And the um, question is, how do you actually write down these type of things? And so now, once we've introduced these background fields, we can actually do that. And so one way of sort of doing this is, in fact, the, the generator. So let's stick with this SU2 example and the SO3 example. So again, let's look at SU2 and SO3. Young Mills in 40. So we have these two fields, B2 and B2 hat. The Z2 value it forms. And we know in this theory we have Wilson lines. Um, and they, they basically are Z2 many Wilson lines. Here we have Toft lines. There are Z2 many Toft lines. And well, we can sort of Think of these as actually coming from the dual one. There's also a one form symmetry, the Z2 electric and Z2 magnetic. So the actual generators of the Z2 um, one form electric, um, these objects here are in fact precisely sort of lines where you have sort of some W and some representation, right? Pass order trace and the representation e to the uh, integral gauge field. Um, uh, uh, that's right. So in fact, what we actually can can say is these actually become a charged under the following operators. These are actually the dp. Um, D2 uh, G operators on two manifolds, which are now E to the integral for B2 hat. And this may be, a, a, before I actually finish this course, it'll become clear why this is true, but this is actually the operator that will link non-trivially with this line operator here. And B2 hat is the dual gauge field, the one form symmetry gauge field, to the uh, one form symmetry that's the background for this symmetry over here, and vice versa. So the one with B2 is actually the one that generates the magnetic Z2 one form symmetry. And um, one way to see that is in terms of this sort of BF type action, and I'll explain that tomorrow in more detail. But that's answering sort of the question that people have asked yesterday. So is this, are there questions about this? So the reason why I actually have to introduce these background fields is because one of the important things that global symmetries give us are Toft anomalies. And we usually write them in terms of the background fields for the symmetries. And the there's a very close connection between the Toft anomalies and non-invertible symmetries. And so we actually have to you know, talk about Toft anomalies before we go to the non-invertible symmetries. So the next sort of thing is Toft anomalies. So these are 
anomalies of quantum field theory for global symmetries. So these are uh, anomalies for global symmetries. So they are not a bug of the theory. They are a feature of the theory. There is a feature, not a bug. Right, and so normally you would, for example, if you have some G0, zero form symmetry, you would calculate them by some triangle diagram and quantum field theory, where these are all global symmetry currents. So these are all global symmetry currents. I want to take a slightly different perspective. I want to say sort of a Toft anomaly is essentially an inconsistency or an, a non-invariance of the theory under background gauge transformations of the background fields of a global symmetry. And then we can sort of apply it in this case uh, already directly. So, but, okay, before we get there, of course, one key utility of these is, uh, these are RG invariants. Right, so you can match Toft anomalies, you can start in the UV theory, calculate them, and go to the IR, and you can match the Toft anomalies uh, from, from the UV into the IR, and they need to agree. So that's really why they're so important, and they will also be important for these types of symmetries. And whereas here you had sort of just zero, zero, zero form symmetries, there will also be now mixed anomalies between zero form, one form, two form symmetries. And so the whole structure of Toft anomalies will become much richer in the setting of these higher form symmetries. So I want to think of a Toft anomaly as is in, so it corresponds to the situation when your partition function of a theory, say now for, for example, for one form symmetry, but you can do this for any P form symmetry, so one form symmetry has a B2 background field. I put the theory in the background for this one form symmetry, and now I do gauge transformation. So ZB2 is not invariant under B background transformations. B2 goes to B2 plus delta lambda one. And I want to basically, this transformation uh, make, so makes the partition function pick up a sign or phase, and that's essentially going to determine the top anomaly. So what I'm saying is we have the theory, we have B2 plus delta lambda 1, and that's now uh, some phase phi of B2 lambda 1. Right, so this is, you could also have put here, let me put it in color. The familiar case is you have some B1. You do a B1 goes to B1 plus delta lambda zero, gauge transformation, and then you pick up a phase. So that's sort of a background transformation. Um, and so this is sort of the non-invariant. Another way of saying it is the partition function doesn't depend actually on the cohomology class of B2. It depends on the representatives. Okay, so how do you remedy this or how do you sort of now define the actual anomaly so we can fix this this by uh, considering uh, coupling the theory to another theory 
a d plus one dimensional so-called anomaly theory. So if you know what anomaly info is, this will be very familiar to you. So this theory I'm going to call a d plus one. And it has the following properties, anomaly theory d plus one. Um, if I put it on a manifold m, let's call it w d plus one, uh, where the boundary of that is empty, then basically a d plus one and, uh, is well defined. And as a function of B2 and also invariant number B2 plus delta lambda 1. So it's actually defined as a function of the cohomology class B2, B2 dependent. However, if I put it on a manifold with a boundary, and the boundary is d-dimensional, then it picks up a phase, and that's then exactly a phase such that it cancels this phase phi that we had over there. So, but if we put a d plus one on a w d plus one, with the boundary is MD is not empty, then I want that theory AD plus one to restrict to precisely uh, on MD plus one to be exactly phi inverse of lambda and B2, B2 lambda, okay? So that's essentially, I'm just engineering a theory that's in d plus one dimensions. I can do, back, so it depends on, 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 the, on, on the background field V2, of course. But then it, as I put it on a manifold with boundary, it actually restricts to exactly the inverse of this phase that we had uh, in our initial theory, this phase, the inverse of that. And that's good because now what we can do is define z tilde as z times a, and this is now, of course, a d plus one, and this is, this is invariant under b2 goes to b2 plus delta lambda one. Okay, but what we're really interested in is this is anomaly theory. So if I have a quantum field theory, and it has a symmetry, a global symmetry, I do background transformations, then I can determine from this essentially the anomaly theory, and that's sort of the thing that is gonna be robust under the RG flows, and we'll see lots of anomalies popping up throughout these lectures. And I'll give you some examples of anomalies um, in, in QFTs uh, that, that are now related to higher form symmetries. So the first example is if you take a three-dimensional theory with a one-form symmetry, uh, some G1, um, and this has a background field B2 in H2, then this can have an anomaly and some e to the, e to the two pi i integral b two b two, right? So the anomaly theory lives now in four dimensions, and the way I should really draw a picture, um, you should really think of this as, and this is sort of a picture that will hopefully become even clearer than tomorrow and more quantified. So we have a theory T, and then we've essentially. attached to it, this is A, so this lives in D dimensions, and this is now D plus one dimensions, 
And this restrict on here is exactly this sort of anomaly thing. In this case, this is. Okay, all right. So this is, this could be now here a three-dimensional theory and you have now this four-dimensional theory attached to it, that's this anomaly. Another example, which is also one that's quite important, is in four dimensions. And now it becomes more interesting because we could now write down sort of real anomalies for theories that we might care for. For, for, for example, four-dimensional um, SUN, N equals to one, super young mills. This happens to have a ZN one form symmetry, that's the center of the SUN, but it also has, from the N equals to one supersymmetry, it has a, um, the U1R symmetry that gets by an ABJ anomaly broken to a Z2N, and that then in the UV gets all the way broken to Z2. This, this zero, zero form symmetry, has a non-trivial anomaly, mixed anom toft anomaly with the one-form symmetry. And so this anomaly basically is equal to e to 2 pi i integral um, a1 b2 squared, where this is the background for the, oh. That's all right. Okay. So um, here A1 is the background for this, uh, this chiral symmetry Z0, and this is the background for the one-form symmetry. And this is actually an anomaly which will be very, very closely related to constructions of non-invertible symmetries. Um, so this is, again, this is a five-dimensional anomaly theory. It lives on some M5, where the boundary of it is the 4dn equals to 1 uh, superangle theory. Okay, so there were lots of things I was going to tell you about invertible things, but then everyone is here because they want to learn about non-invertible things. So I think I need to move on to the non-invertible things. You can ask me about the physics of one-form symmetries and so on in the question session if you would like. There are certain in interesting things to be said about that. But I think I would like to, at this point, maybe open up for questions about anything invertible, and then we will actually migrate to the constructions of non-invertible symmetries. So maybe I have a question about this uh, B2, B2. So you're choosing some quadratic uh, pairing on yes, G1? Right. G1? I, yes, absolutely. So here, really, I should have Pondriagin squared B2, and I specify a, a pairing, and I take a, a refinement of that, a quadratic refinement of it. So here, for example, this would be the actual anomaly is just with the uh, Zn inside here. And so then actually I need to, when n is odd or even, I need to reduce the uh, refine suitably. So I, I'm just putting that onto the carpet, yeah. Uh, why do you assume that it's in the cohomology? I, you might have missed why you said it, the, the forms. Because I want them to be flat background fields. Um, I could also turn on something, some non-trivial background fields, and, but that's right here. These are global symmetry. I would just like to have them to be, have essentially like Wilson, like discrete Wilson lines in, in a two-dimensional theory, for example. You could think of it like that. It's just background fields for global symmetry. Okay, so the Chapter two is sort of constructions of non-invertibles. And 
the example I gave you yesterday were these Verlinda lines in two dimensions. And in fact, we will focus on two dimensions also at the beginning of this section. But before we go there, I want to give you sort of a very quick flavor of why such non-invertible structures could exist in higher dimensions. And there's really like a very simple example um, that we can now understand given what we've done so far. So um, let's look at four dimensions. We're looking at a U1 gauge theory. And so we now know this has uh, topological defects, D2, I think I call them alpha electric, and there's a D2 alpha magnetic. And these were like um, E to the uh, alpha integral star F. F and DF is zero is D star F. So these are topological defects and they generate a U1 electric one form symmetry and a U1 magnetic one form symmetry. So that's group like and it's invertible and it forms a U1 times U1 group. What we would like to consider first is actually gauging of a charge conjugation. And so this actually first appeared in a paper by, on the swamp plant by a bunch of people um, who I will try to recollect. Hayden, Reicher, Delius, Valenzuela, Montero, and Meg Manor, thank you. Um, and this came out of our swamp plant, you know, completeness of spectrum uh, kind of discussion. And when you gauge charge conjugation, what actually happens? So charge conjugation you can think of as a Z2 zero form symmetry. It's a global symmetry that sends A to minus A. And so what does it do to our symmetries here? I mean, first of all, there are also Wilson lines, right, and, and, and Toft lines here. But actually, what does that do to the, the uh, symmetry generator? So in fact, it will act also on this alpha E, and it'll just map F to minus F. So that you can think of as so star F to minus star F, so as alpha goes to minus alpha. And so here alpha is in zero to two pi. So this is how Z20 acts. Now if I want to gauge that, I can't really just sort of stick to these guys because they're not invariant. Um, so the only invariant ones, so the invariant ones topological operators there are the ones for alpha is equal to zero, and then also pi, because pi goes to minus pi, which is the same as pi under this. It's alpha is identified not to pi. So alpha equals to zero and pi. And those are sort of you know, operators I can write down, so zero and d2 pi. But for the others, I have to take combinations. So I need to take a sum of these two operators. And as you do that, so the invariant, let's call these D2 alpha plus, they're defined as just D2 alpha. Okay, I, I'm carrying this electric with me. You can do the same with the magnetic. Uh, it's it's going to be not very different. They're the sum of these two guys, and that's an invariant. So that's also invariant. So the Z2 acts like this. But the crucial difference is that this is now composite, the sum of two of these operators. And now if I actually start looking at the fusion, uh, so if I so, so fuse, I compose them. Well, these ones will just have nice fusion. This is basically the identity, and this one will basically square to uh, the identity. But as I fuse now the D2 
alpha plus, for example, with d2 beta plus, with alpha unequal to beta, right? And here I now need to restrict alpha to be uh, between 0 and pi, excluding these two values because they're invariant. Um, and then actually what happens is uh, we can just multiply this all out, and it'll just give us a d2 alpha plus beta plus plus d2 minus alpha minus beta plus. Right, but these are, again, defined in terms of the, um, uh, sorry, this is the plus here. Right, so these are just defined in terms of this thing here plus minus this thing. So but in this sort of invariant formulation, you get two operators now fusing into the sum of two other operators. So this is essentially the first way you can see this is actually non-invertible. Right, so this is, now after we have gauged, this should be the fusion. So this actually should be the fusion of uh, the one form symmetry generators in the U1 um, modulo Z20 theory, which is actually also called the O2 gauge theory. Now, it didn't stop with this. In that paper, and it came out sort of early, I think, um, 2021 maybe, um, there were also fusions of when alpha is actually equal to beta, you get something slightly more disturbing on the right-hand side. You actually get surfaces and lines and surfaces with lines. And the, that sort of, I think, really... Um, so sort of people were stunned what on earth is going on with these types of symmetries. Uh, I don't want to actually write down what the proposed fusion was because it actually was causing more confusion than anything. But I would like to actually take note that here the key is the fusion of these composite things, which are these invariant combinations, automatically give you a sense of where the non-invertibility com non comes from, right? You, you just multiply this out in the U1 theory, you repackage it, and you get the sum. And we'll see this very often in the following, that gauging uh, outer automorphisms Uh, automorphisms like um, the C2 zero charge conjugation, or we'll also see if you take an SO type theory, there are auto automorphisms on the Dinkin diagram or you have an AN symmetry, uh, gauge symmetry, and you gauge this reflection. Uh, so these are like literally a gauge algebra outer automorphisms. All of these things will yield non-invertible symmetries in the gauged QFTs. Right, so if you take, for example, this here, you take the spin theory and you gauge this outer automorphism, you get, get pin plus. Here you get these so-called SUN tilde theories. In this case, charge conjugation for the U1 theory gave us O2. So these will all have non-invertible symmetries. And once you realize this, there are actually a lot of non-invertible symmetries in our life. Yes, please? Wait. For what? Yeah, so you can also do it, of course, for the case whenever you have a symmetric outer automorphism. For E6 has this, right? You can do this here. But that's it, no? E7 doesn't have any. No? Sorry? E7 doesn't have any outer automorphism. You need a symmetry of the Dinkin diagram. Oh, sorry, I was thinking of the affine Dinkin diagram. Yeah, but here yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you can it's still... Any outer automorphism, 
you can gauge, and you will get these sort of things. Because essentially, you will then um, get this sort of very simple observation that you have an invariant sort of combination of defects. That's the sum of two other defects, and that fusion gives them non-invertibility. OK, but this is all very, very you know, bird's eye vision, because we haven't really understood what's going on here. This is not the true final fusion. I didn't give you the fusion for all the values here for alpha is equal to beta. And that's basically where we'll uh, get to uh, eventually. But I hope this gives you a sense of the um, ubiquity of these, right? It's, it, this is not an exotic, strongly coupled five-dimensional quantum field theory that nobody has heard about. This is four-dimensional Young Mills theory. Okay? Yeah? Uh, does anything special happen with uh, SO8 because of its triality? Yeah, so there you can gauge, for if you have a spin mm -hmm. eight, you actually can gauge the full S3. And that's a very interesting thing to do. Yes. Thank you. Because it's not a billion. OK, but be, after this motivation, what I want to do now is go back to very firm ground and talk about something you know, extremely basic and then try to build up Again, starting with two dimensions, really everything is extremely under control in two dimensions, then building up uh, the structure from 2D to 3D to 4D. So unless there are any other questions about this sort of example, I want to now actually discuss um, two-dimensional, non-invertible symmetries in a very specific construction. So this is sort of about non-invertibles in 2D. From gauging. And you'll see there's a lot of non invertible symmetries arise from gauging things we know very well. And that's why we need to learn about gauging in quite some detail. And I want to start with something extremely trivial in two dimensions. So, in two dimensions, um, we have, well, in, in two dimensions, we can have a theory T. And let's say it has a zero form symmetry, which is group like. Okay, it's a group, it's a zero form global symmetry. So we now know why I was talking about these, these lines, these Verlinda lines at the very beginning of the first lecture. So these are now labeled by G elements, and they have fusions H is D1, GH. Right, for all G and H in G. This is it. This is, and now, so how do I think about this? Well, I have a line, this, so I'll label this line D1G. So what is actually this here? I can very often write this sort of as I have a G here, I have an H here, and I call this here G times H. So this is essentially uh, almost all the structure that we have here. And if I sort of have um, a, a line that, that corresponds to, say, the, uh, a generator G here, right? I also, in principle, could ask, are there any topological operators on this line? And actually, there are, there are none as long as this line actually is essentially one of the, these generators. So the really interesting structure is just there's a fusion on such topological lines. There's also a little bit more structure. So if I have such a thing, um, I also, of course, I, I, I don't necessarily only want to be able to compose two of these. I also have to ask well, if I have three lines, um, how can I actually have a G, H, and K? Um, there are different ways I could compose them. I could first fuse G and H, and then I bring in K, and that should give us G, H, K. And that should be the same as if I first take K, fuse it with H, and then bring in G. All right? So this is the sort of structure, and this is all group-like. Now, one can refine this a little bit. Um, one can sort of 
uh, add a little bit more structure and a so-called uh, co-cycle omega from g times g times g into u1 that I can just attach to one of these diagrams. And one thing you could think of, right? So basically you're saying this is equal to that times omega of g, h, and k. And so of course not any omega of this type is allowed. If I now take four of them, it needs to be again compatible with that. So associativity then implies that actually omega is in what's called H3 of G U1. So the closeness of this is precisely the condition that if I take all these four and move these around in different orders, that these omega satisfy that this diagram sort of is consistent throughout. Okay, so this structure that I just defined here, really there's nothing interesting going on. I have a group-like symmetry, we fuse them, there could be some additional phases, you can even ignore them if you like. And this is a structure that a mathematician, and you know, we've already let string filter in the room, we will now let the categories in as well, we'll call VEC G. So this is just what you call VEC G. There's nothing interesting going on here. It's group-like topological lines, and that's how you should think about this category. So what we want to do is gauge this group. And because this group actually, I didn't say anything because it's a zero form symmetry, I should maybe emphasize this, a zero form symmetry can be non-abelian. It's a, it's a group, it's finite, but not necessarily abelian. Right, the zero form symmetry can be non-abelian. In fact, the interesting things happen when G is non-abelian. So what does it mean to gauge this G zero? So in, in a standard sort of setting where you do two-dimensional conform field theories, you have a symmetry, you want to gauge that, you call this orbifolding, and we all probably have done examples of that in 2D CFTs. I want to do it in a slightly more categorical way that actually talks to these symmetries, but this is nothing other than sort of doing this orbifold construction. And there'll be a couple, and I'll actually set omega equal to zero because omega is actually like a Toft anomaly for the zero form symmetry. So if omega is actually non-zero, then we have some issues with actually gauging this. And there'll be various takes on gauging, and there'll be various levels of familiarity, and they are disproportionate to um, the generalizability to higher dimensions. So the first take is, well, what does it mean to gauge? We introduce a background gauge field. H is an H1 of our two-dimensional space with G coefficients. So actually to do this, here we really should assume that this is abelian, so this is, this is why this is a little bit hazy, but you can also, you can generalize this, but let's, let's not uh, get, here we can assume for simplicity it's abelian. So what it becomes here, we, this becomes a dynamical field. H field. And in the gauge theory, so this is when I do the mod G zero, what actually is happening is I can now actually construct operators, which are just in some representation R, the G representation, there's the trace R e to the i integral B one. Right, so these are Wilson lines, I can define in that gauge theory. And in fact, because B1 is closed, I can um, infer that these are actually topological. So DB1 is zero, and so in fact, these, these WRs are topological. Uh, 
And now I want to know, okay, so these WRs, if I take one and I bring it close together to another, again, uh, R1 with some other representation, well, what actually happens is that this just becomes the sum over some coefficients, R1, R2, R3, W, R3. And there's something here about R3, where these are just sort of the, the Klebsch Gordon. coefficients when you decompose the tensor product of R1 and R2 into IREPS R3. So I really, really should call this here something like D1, R1, etc. And so actually, what happens is in that theory before, we had something that was completely group-like. We gauge it, we get a gauge field, we can construct these these, these, these Wilson lines, and they now have a fusion, which is given in terms of the structure WR1 with these coefficients here. And generically, if I have a tensor product of representations, this isn't just like a single one, but actually this will be a, a sum over a bunch question. of... Yes. Yes? Yeah, in, in order to have this structure, then you need uh, to have non-abelian group. I know. I will give the full argument of non-abelian also, so what you can do is, a billion there. I, okay, so basically you can also, you don't need to, we can def generalize what it means to put this background. Basically what it means is we, we take the two-dimensional theory and now we um, include a mesh of lines, of these topological lines, and then we can ask what are the lines that are allowed and are blind to these other lines, because we're gauging this, the lines in the gauge theory should not actually feel the, this mesh of lines. So that's the more proper way of doing that. It's true, here I'm doing abelian, and indeed, when it's abelian, this all becomes extremely uh, trivial. But, so in this case, indeed, this is uh, sort of for abelian, a good point. That's why I'm saying this is take one. Take two will be, there's a better way of doing this. And take three, if I have time, will basically do what I just explained to you. So abelian, it means that essentially these are just, the, the reps are just characters, so determined by the characters. And then in fact, we can see now that the dual symmetry is also just going to be an abelian symmetry. Okay, so um, when you do this, so the, um, the representations, right, so the character for an e to the i theta I say e to the 2 pi i over n even, right? If I take this to the n, it needs to satisfy that this is equal to uh, actually that entity, but it also is equal, if this is g here, uh, this is also the same as equal to character of g to the n, which is equal to the character of the identity, is equal to one, so then actually you, you find that character of g to the n is equal to one. So in fact, these are also just the n dual lines, these representations. So this is just saying that the dual, in this case, for um, g zero abelian is just um, isomorphic to g zero again. But if for a moment we disregard this fact that it came from here, this will be the general structure. More generally, you will get something that actually is, not, is, is uh, completely non-invertible in this case. And since you brought it up, I, I think I will. So when t what time did I start? When do I need to finish? More relevant question. In 15 minutes, 15 in, minutes. Included, including questions. Okay. Then you will have to ask your question again. So. The take two is, so this is actually, right, I was a little uh, cheating here, but now what I'll tell you is, really, we can think of this 
in the following way, and this is really um, what also then generalizes to higher dimensions and incorporates essentially almost all constructions of non-invertible symmetries. And this is sort of work we've done with, and at this point this is I post on Galaxia Bardwaj and Jing Chang Wu, um, and then also Bardwaj and Tivari in a more general setting. And also applications with my student, Lea, who is there, so Bardwaj, Tivari, and Votini, who fits in here. If you have questions, Leah is right there. Uh, so <laughs> uh, anyway, so what is actually the idea of this, this paper here is, um, so let's for a moment just think about the following problem. If this two-dimensional theory T, and it has a global symmetry G0 acting on it, and I want to gauge this. and get to a theory that I call uh, T mod G. So when I do this, I can do something before I gauge, or just take a product with T Q of T's. So T Q of T's will be an ever recurring theme here. I can take a product of a one dimensional topological theory which has with G symmetry. And I'll tell you what these are in a moment. So just take on this side the product T times this TQFT with G symmetry. And then I gauge whilst you know, this theory has a G symmetry, this has a G symmetry. I'm gauging now the diagonal G symmetry. And what happens after we do this is that here, this is now not a product of two theories, the TQFT and the theory, but actually this now becomes a topological defect in this gauged theory. So this is now a D1, whatever, some label alpha. So in this, right, so this is the theory, which is now actually not T mod G, but T times the TQFT G mod G, and the important thing is, it's really I'm gauging this diagonal G, and this has become, this is now a topological defect. in the theory. So, you might say, why on earth are you doing this? And I will say, well, you've been doing this all the time. And so in four dimensions, if you, for example, look at a U1 symmetry, a global symmetry, then you know very well the concept of a theta angle, right? So theta F wedge F. You can think of this as exactly a U1 preserving topological field theory that I, it's basically trivial, and I just start with a trivial theory with a trivially acting U1 symmetry. I add this topological term and then I gauge the U1, right? And then what I get is basically the integral uh, F with star F, one of G squared plus theta F with F. And this is essentially, you know, the theta angle, you can think of it as what's called a symmetry protected topological phase. I'll talk about those in more detail when we generalize this to higher dimensions. In this case, it's a U1 SPT phase. And what you've done is you start with a trivial theory, you add this term, you gauge a diagonal, and you get your favorite theory with the theta angle. So in this sense, these type of defects, we can call them also theta defects because they're really nothing other than a sort of implementation of the same idea now in these two-dimensional theories and later in higher dimensions. So why is this now a useful thing to do? We can now look at this problem that we're discussing here. We had a global G symmetry. Now G can be non-abelian, no problem at all. 
Now, what actually is, what are TQFTs with G symmetry? So one dimensional. Well, TQFTs and one dimensions are really quite trivial. They'll be characterized by a set of vacua. Well, there's no dynamics. It's really literally just a set of vacuum of E1 until the end. And then the fact that they're, they have a G symmetry, it means that G acts on it. So G acts on the vacua in a consistent way, which means these vacua, so these collections of vacua V, V forms a G representation. And so, once I'm at this point, I can say, well, what I'm getting here is I'm attaching these type of TQFTs here, and I'm gauging these, and so basically what, what's happening is these, these, uh, these topological defects are given essentially by uh, G representations. And now I can ask how does the fusion work? Well, you can sort of see if you have V1 to Vn, and you have W1 to Wm, and G is acting on these, right? And there's some decomposition into EREPs of these and of the Ws as well that their fusion is precisely, now G will act on the collection of vacua V1, VI, WJ, precisely as uh, in terms of uh, the tensor product representation. So, so if I now label these things here, by basically D1R, so this is given in terms of vacuum one to vacuum N, D1R1, let's call this here V, W, W1, Wm. All right, now the question is, what is W1R tensor W1, uh, D1R W? So I have to now take the tensor product of these things and decompose it again back into G, because G acts on this full collection of things, so this will exactly be what I wrote down over there. So that's a much more stupid annotation, unfortunately, but I'll be a U, R, D1, R, U, right? Because the vacua of these guys are essentially, on this side, we have just V, I, W, J. That's the collection of vacua for that T, Q, F, T. And now I have a G action on this, and I just decompose it into EREPs. So in this way, I generically, in particular when this is a non-abelian group, these are now non-invertible topological lines, and this is perfect sort of board usage because we had here vec G. What is this set? This is actually what people call the representations of G fusion category. And that's for G non-abelian, The fusion is non invertible. And now I'm probably at, well, five, so five, minutes. Uh, five minutes. So I can now say, well, this was a two dimensional theory, and I had a one dimensional TQFT, and it gave me these one dimensional defects. If I have a a d-dimensional theory, then I can in fact here take TQFTs, g of dimension d minus one, um, stack them on top, and then I would get a non-invariable d minus one um, defect generically. So this is the idea that we get non-invertibles by gauging um, 
these, these zero form symmetries. And the way we actually determine the symmetries in the dual theory is by determining these GT QFTs. And I'll go through this explicitly in, in three dimensions in the first lecture tomorrow, and then we'll see examples of quantum field theories where these non-invertible symmetries are happening. And also, some of you will know about condensation defects, and they're sort of exactly these types of topological defects. Is there something else I wanted to say? All right, so maybe I should write this down what I just said in words, because that's sort of the important punchline. Um, so what we've seen is in two dimensions, right, if I take this vec G, so this is literally just math code word for G0, zero form symmetry. And I gauge that it doesn't have any of these anomalies. I can gauge it. Then I will get the symmetry category rep G, which is for G0, just the representations. And the fusion is just the tensor product is basically the tensor product decomposition. And for G non abelian, this is non invertible. And we, these, these uh, defects here, these D1R, are essentially coming from one dimensional GTQFTs. And we'll see tomorrow that in three dimensions, there's also sort of a way to have a, a, non, a, a completely invertible, invertible group like zero form symmetry. And we actually here would get uh, what's called a two category, two vec G. Again, this is just code for an invertible group like zero form symmetry. We gauge this and we get what's called a two representation of G. And what these are are essentially condensation defects for this symmetry. Okay, so are there any questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I understand that these are some non-invertible non operations. So in what sense are they symmetries? Do they ah, preserve some correlation yes, function? Yes, so, so in fact, in the, I constructed it basically very abstract. It didn't tell you what is this theory T2, right? But it could have been any two-dimensional CFT or two-dimensional quantum field theory that has a zero form symmetry. Like, whichever, so for example, you could have, um, I guess you could do an, an SO3 WGW and act with the S3 and gauge that. You would get these types of things. And they would act on the CFT, on the gauge theory. They would, yeah, you can, these, these are, these are generally, you know, zero forms and the global symmetries of that theory. So you can act, for example, in this case, you can really insert them into a torus partition function, right? You can uh, insert them into D1G, for example, or D1R. Let's put an A index here, Q to the L0, for example. So you insert them into like this. And you can compute correlation functions or partition functions with those lines inserted. So for the Linda lines, this is very well studied because you know exactly what their fusion is from the Verlinda formula and so on. So these are, in, in, in this case, they're really acting still on local operators, right? The interesting thing here is that these now become uh, also one form symmetries and higher form symmetries that are non-invertible that act on line operators, for example. So those so, will preserve the correlation functions of the line operators? Yes, so then you can, for, for example, you can ask, for example, in, just in the invertible one-form symmetry case, you can ask what is actually um, the action on the Wilson lines, on the Toft lines, and it, we'll see non-invertible one-form symmetries, and then there's a question, how do you actually act on the, the line operators? 
because now it's a representation of this object. It's not a group representation question anymore, but it becomes a question of how do you actually represent this sort of structure. Uh, I have a good question. So here we assume that G is final group. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, if it's, if I, if I'm it's, just I, wondering if there's some sort of uh, uh, minimal kind of physically sensible example where uh, where this uh, representation uh, category is not semi-simple. Ah, yes. So maybe it's some topologically twisted theory um, where you have. Well, if, if one takes some yeah. G not finite group, uh, oh, one mm -hmm. can have non semi simple mm -hmm. category yeah. representation where you have you want. Uh, right. Six, okay. Uh, you you wouldn't have these uh, unique decompositions, and there will be some other issues. Yeah. You you would have what? I mean, you would you wouldn't have uh, this unique decomposition in particular in the, in the direct. Right, side. but I mean, so for example, like your Q mod Z story, or what what, what do you mean? Well, yeah, I mean, but is it, well, it's an infinite it's example. There it's an example mm -hmm. of an infinite. But no, I mean, there, there can be some sort of group which is, uh, I don't know, well, the simple, simplest example is something like uh, you get uh, continue, oh, continuous, yes, continuous right, group right, of right, uh, right, triangle uh, or uh, matrices uh, 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 like uh, uh, this. Whoops, so. oh, oh, gosh. All right. We'll sort out the... Okay. Yeah, we can clean it up. Yeah, comedy looking at this point. So there's one, it's like a domino effect. The chalk goes down and this goes down. Anyway. Um, yeah, uh, that's actually an interesting way. So actually, what is then the fusion of the, the results? Because you can obviously do the same thing. You can ask, what are the TQFTs that are symmetric under such a thing? I don't know whether that's known, but then you can stack them. Uh, this construction is also interesting. I don't think that has been sort of studied from this perspective. You could also think of um, constructing line operators in quantum field theories in this way. By now, not taking TQFTs, but say one dimensional theories or maybe one you know, two dimensional surface operators and engage in this way, construct non trivial operator, defect operators. Other questions? Just want to check again why we wanted a one-dimensional topological theory. Could ah, we just do okay. a Okay. Yes. So here it was P. because I wanted to. Uh, well, okay. So I, I was gauging a zero-form symmetry, and I just, you know, could have generalized in higher dimensions. In fact, you can generalize it to a p-form symmetry, and then you could have TQFTs that are protected by p-form symmetries or even higher group symmetries. Here, I mean. What are the options? I could have done a local operator, a topological local operator. There's not a lot of structure there, but a one dimension, or I just stack a full T, two dimensional theory on top, right? Um, that would sort of be something like um, generating a minus one form symmetry. So here, right, the, the reason why I'm doing this is because I actually am constructing now topological lines um, that generate a zero form symmetry that should be the dual symmetry. Right? What this is, is really a way of constructing the dual symmetry from this stacking with TQFTs. Right? The dual symmetry is nothing other than uh, whatever, if I start with this and I gauge it, this B hat I had at the very beginning. Um, but now I'm not restricting myself to, to any kind of abelian G or whatever. But you don't, you're not restricted. This is sort of the simplest example. We'll see other more complicated situations. Okay, maybe we can proceed, uh, postpone the first questions to the discussion okay. session. And let's um, thank Sakura again. Uh, if you want to hear a few remarks about the pizza tonight, uh, please uh, yeah, stay around. Uh, so let me. Just uh, make a few remarks. So, so yeah, you probably, you, in principle, you received this information. So there will be uh, two buses. Uh